Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to the Youth Resilience in the Digital Age Conference. Bonjour ou bonsoir, selon l'endroit où vous êtes, et bienvenue à la conférence sur la résilience des jeunes. On behalf of the Canadian Teachers Federation and the Boys and Girls Clubs of Canada, we would like to recognize the contributions of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples of Canada. Dans un esprit de réconciliation au nom du milieu de l'éducation, we acknowledge and give gratitude to the Indigenous peoples whose land we are on today. My name is Jamili Baroud, and I am the Program Officer for the Canadian Teachers Federation. I'll be responsible for moderating this session today from Vancouver, British Columbia. Before we start, I'd like to recognize that this initiative was made possible by funding from Employment and Social Development Canada, and that this week's conference is proudly co-hosted by the Canadian Teachers Federation and the Boys and Girls Clubs of Canada. Please also note that today's session will be recorded so that the presentation can be made available in the future. Avant de commencer, j'aimerais de vous rappeler que la session sera enregistrée pour qu'elle soit disponible après la conférence. A short Q&A period will follow the presentation. Please use the Q&A function to ask questions to the presenter or to communicate with technical staff. Feel, please also feel free to use the chat function to connect with other participants, share resources, and interact. Voyez noter que la session aujourd'hui se déroule en anglais. Cependant, soyez à l'aise à poser des questions ou à faire des commentaires dans le chat en français ou en anglais. At the end of the presentation, I'll invite the presenter to answer your questions in the order that they were asked. And now I'm glad to welcome Karen Stintz and Archie Allison. Karen Stintz is currently president and CEO of Variety Village. Variety Village is an all-inclusive facility in Southeast Scarborough that has been serving hundreds of thousands of families since 1949. Before joining Variety Village, Karen was a Toronto City Councillor for 11 years, and while serving on council was chair of the Toronto Transit Commission. The Toronto Transit Commission is the third largest transit system in North America. As chair of the TTC, she oversaw large capital projects, a billion dollar operating budget, and the implementation of new technology to improve customer service. She's also worked at the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, and in the private sector. Her, degree, her degrees include a Master of Public Administration from Queen's University, a Bachelor of Science in Communication from Boston University, and a Bachelor of Arts from Western University. Mr. Allison began his career working with persons with a disability when he was hired as a program instructor at Variety Village in 1984. Throughout his years at Variety, he continued his studies and training and is currently the Director of Access and Awareness. Mr. Allison has been a tireless advocate for people of all ages and abilities. His passion is infectious and his success in the areas of accessibility, integration and independence has set him apart from everyone else in the field. Mr. Allison also instructs weekly classes at the University of Toronto, Humber College and Centennial College, where he teaches courses based on inclusive recreation. Karen and Mr. Allison's presentation today is called Introduction to Inclusion, Inclusive Programming and Ability in Action. Welcome Karen and Mr. Allison, thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much. Duncan, do you mind rolling the video? Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here today to talk about youth resilience. 
um, particularly because uh, as you know, Arch and I, we work with youth and we work with children with a disability and we can tell you every day we're a witness to what resilience means uh, for these kids and for us. And so it's a real privilege, as I say, to be here. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes and just talk about Variety, the children's charity and Variety Village. Um, depending on where you are in the country, you may know about Variety BC and Variety Ontario. Uh, we're actually part of a global charity. Uh, for 90 years, Variety, the children's charity has been serving children with disabilities across the globe. Uh, in Ontario, we've been active for 70 years. And uh, originally actually um, in Ontario, we decided to fulfill the mission to help children with a disability by bu building a school. Because in the 40s, uh, children with a disability weren't accepted into the mainstream school system. And uh, we knew, uh, our charity knew that the best way that a child could achieve their full potential was through a good education. So for the first 30 years, we were a residential boys school and we had uh, boys from all, all across the province come to a uh, variety village where they received this great education. And uh, we also created these ambassadors for change and inclusion. And over 30 years, these graduates went out into their communities and they advocated for change and inclusion into the school systems in their local communities. And we like to say that we were a victim of our own success because in the 1970s, uh, school boards recognized that all children needed a disability, all children needed an education regardless of their ability. And they made that possible for all kids. But we had this great facility. We had this incredible legacy of helping kids with disabilities. So during the 70s, 80s and 90s, we thought, you know, what is the next best way that we can help a child with a disability achieve their full potential after they get a great education? And the reality is, and many of you know, that the next best opportunity for kids to achieve their full potential is through participation in sport and rec. Because through those opportunities, they learn competition, they learn team building, they learn skill development, they learn confidence, they learn how to work together and they achieve. And when they achieve something in sport, they take that lesson of achievement and they take it through all areas of their life. And again, a fun fact for, uh, for our legacy is that since the 1970s, early 80s, uh, variety athletes and coaches have represented Canada at every single Summer Paralympic Games. So that's a legacy that we're pretty proud of. But again, um, over those ensuing years, we became again the victim of our own success and parasport became more mainstream than it was when we first um, built out our facility to support athletes across the province. So in the 2000s, again, parasport was more mainstream, newer facilities were built, more coaches were developed, more athletes were trained. And again, we turned our time and attention to, okay, after a child receives a great education, after a child has a chance to participate in sport, you know, what is the next best opportunity that we can bring to children and families with a disability? And so now at our center at Variety Village, we offer sports uh, training and recreational programming for kids with disabilities and their families. And again, why do we do this? Why is this so important? Because children, self, children with a disability self-report that 50% of kids with a disability say they don't have any friends. And this was before the lockdowns. This was before moving to a digital age. Kids with a disability just don't have the same opportunities to play with each other, to interact, to build those skills, uh, to do the things that uh, we might take for granted in our daily lives. So we recognized that we had a critical program that we needed to offer. And throughout our history, we had been offering our programming at Variety Village. But we knew even before the pandemic hit that not every child with a disability in their family could come to Variety Village. So it became our imperative to take our programming out of our facility into communities across Ontario. Because although the government had legislative that space would be accessible for all, the reality is accessible programming doesn't just rely on accessible space. There needs to be a culture of inclusion, a culture of accessibility, a culture of adapt adaptation so that kids can really feel as if they can be included in the programming that takes place in a building. And we knew from our experience that although buildings are accessible, they had ramps, they had um, ways, they had elevators, they didn't have the culture of accessibility that would allow a child to come into a community, come into a center, participate in a rec program in the same way that every other kid can do. So that was the mission that we adopt, embraced uh, over the last four years. And we were um, committed to bringing our programming out into communities across Ontario. And over the last four years, we have been successful in introducing our programming across seven municipalities in Ontario, 
Uh, we've also brought one of our programs to Alberta. And uh, again, we've launched another program nationally with our partners uh, uh, in BC and Alberta. So we've been doing incredible work promoting kids with disabilities, promoting sport and recreation, supporting accessible programming. And at Variety Village, we have the Ability in Action program, which Archie's going to speak about. We have our Children in Motion program, which Archie's going to speak about. And we have our Bolt Hockey program. But before I turn it over to Archie, um, you know, just a bit of context framing about how, you know, we understood the importance of accessible programming um, and bringing our, the, that culture of inclusion into different locations, e even before the pandemic hit. And part of the value and part of the richness of our programs was that we could be interactive with these kids. We could learn from these kids. We could, you know, help them integrate. We could actually bring programs to communities where children and their siblings could play because we hear from parents who have a child with disability how hard it is to find programming that both their kids or all their kids can participate in. So that was what we brought to Ontario and to these families through our partnerships. We, we partner through the Boys and Girls Club, we partner through the Y, we partner through municipalities because you know we don't build centers, we bring programming, we bring culture change. But then the pandemic hit. And all the in-person programming that we did, all the value that we brought to our partners suddenly had to stop because we couldn't do in-person programming anymore. So at all of these seven locations that we had across the province, all the programming just suddenly stopped. And it's been stopped for a year. So kids that are already disadvantaged because they don't have the same opportunity to play. They can't just go down to the park and, you know, go down the slide and hang and hang and play with their friends. That, 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 that's just not the same opportunity for these kids. So our programs that, are, again, were so needed then became unavailable. These kids still don't have access to friends. They still don't have access to inclusive programming. And now it's just been made more challenging because of the pandemic and the restrictions of being able to have this interactive play. So we quickly figured out, we quickly realized we weren't gonna be able to use that model anymore. So what were we gonna do? What were we gonna do to help these kids and their families? And, and Archie's gonna talk a little bit more about it. But again, one of the richness one of the values, true values of our program is that interactive piece, the kids being able to play together. So as we think about designing a program for the digital age, how do we keep that piece? How do we keep these kids connected? How do we keep them connected safely? Because we have, there's so many things that we need to overcome in terms of developing a digital program for kids. Cause you know, we just can't take a video of someone doing exercise and doing sport and rec and then put it on YouTube and expect a child with a disability to be able to follow along. So we had to really think about how do we engage that child? How do we make sure that they have that opportunity for independent participation? And how do we create the opportunity for the children to interact with each other? And so it's a process that we've begun. It continues to unfold. We've had great success delivering our Ability in Action program virtually. We've had incredible success delivering some of our other programs virtually. Um, but our Children in Motion program, one of our key signature programs is, is still under development. And with that, let me turn it over to Archie so he can talk about some of the some of the innovative things that we've been doing as we rethink the delivery of our programs in a digital age. Archie. Thank you, Karen. I have to first compliment Karen because without her leadership and her innovative ideas, these would all be things that we would be still struggling to try and figure out. So Karen stepped up really quickly when everything started to happen and say, what can we do? How can we impact the kids are being impacted by this, by, by COVID and by the lack of social and physical interaction they were getting. So again, thank you to Karen for your leadership and, and your excitement around making sure there's possibilities for kids to continue to play and participate. Um, I've been working here at Freddie Village for a very long time. <laughs> this is, I'm going, it's my 38th year. So I've been fortunate to kind of watch some of the programs from their inception and, and know kind of the practical delivery of the program but being at an age where technology is not always my friend or doesn't always cooperate with me, um, I'm learning myself, but the virtual realities of digital uh, resilience as well. <laughs> um, with Children in Motion, Children in Motion started as a program in 1984 at Variety Village, and it was a great way to bring the kids from the community together with their uh, children with disabilities and their able-bodied peers. At that time, we had 200 children a week participating, and it was Monday nights, Friday nights, and Saturday mornings. And each class had about 40 children registered in each session with eight classes going. So our field house was always kind of busy with kids playing and being active. And people from around the world were visiting Variety Village to say, how are you doing this? How are you making this happen? And how are you getting kids to play together? They were playing together and we were just making it happen. 
we were figuring things out as we went and we were trying to understand the importance of accessible and inclusive programming through play. And Children in Motion created that venue where kids could play together, be active, learn more about adapted sports and meet their friends from the neighborhood in a lot of cases. So being here for a long time, what's been interesting for me is I've known a lot of the children in the programs that I used to teach and those same children um, ended up in my classes at college and university. And the fascinating part for me to watch that evolution was to hear the, the people that were students down my college university's classes saying that Bryony Village was the first place they were exposed to and introduced to children with disabilities. And they had no reservations about actively engaging, involving people with disabilities in their programs or services anymore. The other students in the class didn't have the same opportunities or experiences, and they were a little more hesitant when we um, invited uh, speakers or staff with disabilities to programs. The other, the other students often sat back and were more hesitant to kind of introduce or um, connect with the people with disabilities as opposed to the children that were in the Children in Motion program. So that full circle component of play and participation and kind of lifelong learning really kind of started with Children in Motion here at Brady Village. Again, with Karen's leadership, we were lucky to try and um, build out our programs. The community was in desperate need of getting kids more active, uh, creating more inclusive opportunities, and providing play for kids with disabilities and their peers in their own neighborhoods. And it wasn't happening. So uh, MLSC Launchpad who was one of our first community partners. Uh, Karen initiated a partnership with them so we could actually get kids playing and active in programs. So every Saturday morning, kids with disabilities were coming uh, to the program to play, participate, and for many of them, make a friend for the very first time. The program was uh, very popular not only with the children with disabilities, but with the families and the parents and the guardians who waited in the mainstay area of the facility to watch what was happening and to see their kids play and interact. And for a lot of the parents, they said they didn't think their children would respond to physical activity or social invitations or play. So as you watch the parents get excited about it, you, you thought this program has so, so much opportunity to, to excite people in the neighborhoods. We continue to kind of grow the programs out and Vaughn has been knocking on our door for many years now trying to get programs started back there uh, again Saturday afternoon uh, one of our staff went every Saturday afternoon and ran a program um, I would say the entire makeup of the program was by children with disabilities and children with autism uh, there was a definite need in the community to make those things happen and the children motion program met those needs so when COVID hit the first call we got was from Vaughn saying what are we going to do because families that weren't involved before in that community were now involved and the kids were active and the kids were asking, when am I going back to Bray Village Children in Motion program? Uh, in addition to that, we started to introduce the program in Mississauga and right before we launched the program, COVID hit. So we had a, a big pause button happen there. Um, Aaron Oak Children's Center and the municipality are very excited to continue the program get things started. So I think that the impact and the devastating part was that kids were actually being um, recognized and welcome to play in their own neighborhoods with Bright, Bright Ontario staff leading those initiatives. And now those kids were actually staying home, isolated, lonely, anxious, and afraid in a lot of cases. The friendships they had started to make um, weren't always happening um, for a lot of different reasons. But I think as, as we look to the programs, the community involvement, again, with Karen's excitement and enthusiasm around creating virtual opportunities, we now have a platform to reintroduce those kids, familiarize them again with staff, familiarize them again with their friends, and create a space where kids can play and be active. We also want them to be represented. Uh, a lot of times when their programs are offered virtually, they're often led by uh, someone who doesn't often reflect the, the people that are involved in the program. So involving kids with disabilities in the program and the leadership of the activities excites other people to get more involved and do more things. So in addition, in addition to the three communities that um, are happy in the community with Children in Motion, there's a lot of um, excitement around when we get, when we will launch the virtual experience, which will be Karen the end of March, maybe, <laughs> possibly. Um, so there's a lot of excitement around that, and people are, are um, looking forward to virtual participation in, in place of that practical experience. Not to say that we won't offer the practical experience when it happens again, but now we've started to kind of reflect and think, how do we offer something so that everybody can be active and everybody can, can be involved? So that digital experience is going to be a great platform for that opportunity as well. So that's our Children in Motion program. I had to write notes because I have a lot of things to say. <laughs> um, the Ability in Action program started in 1987. Um, it was introduced for schools, elementary and high school, to introduce kids with disabilities to their peers um, outside the classroom. 
what the experiences were from a lot of our families at Variety Village was they were saying that the kids were active here at Variety Village, but not in any of their classes. They participated fully in the academic learning experience, but not in any physical activity platforms. So during recess, during lunch, and during uh, physical education classes, students were often left on the sidelines, uh, left to score, or in some cases were told to wheel back and forth in the hallway to keep them active, but not to um, involve them in the, the participation pieces. So Build in Action, built at Freddy Village, um, welcomed roughly between six and 7,000 children a year from all over the GTA and outside. And students were saying uh, it was the first experience they've had to interact with their other friends who were disabled in their class. And for the educators and, and the teaching staff, they were all saying it was a great chance to learn and explore adapted sport, para sport, and potential Paralympic, Special Olympic, or deaf sports in some cases. Because there, there's a lack of exposure experience to introduce those those possibilities. Brady Village and Brady Ontario had an opportunity to kind of create that experience at Brady Village and then at the school. So our staff and ambassadors would go to a school, uh, participate in a two or four hour session with students or the entire school in some cases, and really kind of focus on the components of play participation for all. So everybody is now welcome, everybody is now playing. And again, uh, COVID hit and it kind of impacted our participation numbers quite significantly. And through a new virtual platform, we have a new grade specific learning experience for students to participate virtually. Uh, it was introduced in January, Karen, am I right? January? Um, I'm, I'm losing track of time. <laughs> in January, uh, with great success and, and a lot of great feedback that although the children aren't physically active at Freddy Village or in their school, uh, they're participating virtually and they're getting that chance to kind of interact physically and socially with other students and other educators as well. So new experience for us to kind of introduce as a virtual platform and a great learning tool for students and for us as well. In addition to that, we started to look at training, development, workshops, our introduction to inclusive programming practices. And typically those were involved um, all through practical application. Um, the biggest response we got from people was the practical experience, the chance to interact, and the teamwork components that were really kind of built on the design of the program itself. So introducing this as a virtual platform was new for us, um, as we're still kind of working at some of the, the things we're doing. Uh, we've had a chance to do some additional qualification training for teachers. We've had a chance to offer programs for staff training and for students as well. Uh, college university programs are looking for ideas to make things more inclusive and um, offer students experiences to learn in, in another environment. So that virtual application of the digital resilience has really happened through the conversations around what does this look like, what can we do, and how can we offer it. The, the interesting part through all this is introducing the physical and the social experience through activity. So in an environment where it's in person or direct delivery, you have a great chance to kind of talk with, share, and connect with your peers. Through virtual platforms, um, it's a little bit different. Through social application, a lot of times it's led through conversation um, with few opportunities for students to interact or engage. And for physical activities, uh, for anybody that um, has children that are participating in virtual physical activities at home, there's a big chance something's going to get broken <laughs> in your house. So we tried to kind of initiate those ideas to think about that online experience to keep safe, uh, to keep space, uh, to store things properly, and um, provide space so you can play and participate in a virtual experience as well. So th that's kind of three of the main programs we've introduced virtually, but in addition to that, we've also, uh, we have uh, eight competitive teams at Variety as well. And our Special Olympics swim team, um, a big component of that was around um, social uh, experiences, social connections, friendships, um, and the opportunity to, to train and compete and be physically active. Immediately when COVID hit, um, we were we were stuck. Our facility was closed for a duration of time, and Karen suggested the the virtual experience again. So we we are introducing our personal trainers to the Sunshine Swim Team, which is the name of our Special Olympics swim team, to do personal training and focus on swimming technique and elements of swimming. And with a 15 minute session at the end as well, it's a chance for everybody to kind of connect, talk, and maintain those friendships too. It's been very successful and we were very surprised because of the success through the virtual platform and the way it's worked out. But in addition to that, when we can reopen our pool, which we hope will be someday soon, um, all those swimmers are ready to come back and um, maintain the physical distance, uh, think about kind of the spacing issues, 
think about hygiene and think about kind of the elements of safety that are important and transition them back into sport too. So we're pretty excited to welcome people back and in the interim to create that virtual platform. But in addition, it might be an experience for future to offer practical and virtual delivery of program for people that live outside of the, the Scarborough or Toronto region who have difficulty getting transportation to and from our, our venue. Uh, we've also offered Taekwondo now uh, two to three times a week to introduce and keep people uh, active in the programs and the training elements as well. And coming soon, we'll be offering virtual volunteer and placement student experiences too for students to continue getting their practicum experience and um, opportunities in that as well. So a lot of things happening, um, <laughs> a lot going on, a lot of um, interest in providing opportunities for what was designated as a, a very low participation rate by people with disabilities, being at three to 7% in some cases across the country. And if you think about what Variety Ontario is doing now, um, they're, they're continuing, they're building on those participation rates. For all the kids that were staying at home before, there was a lot of conversation around the amount of screen time and video games that kids were playing. And when they were that involved at home, maybe this is a chance to reach out to get more kids involved and more kids active through a virtual element of participation too. Karen, did I miss anything? <laughs> so we started to look at a couple of things, um, looking at online safety. So one of the things that was important to us was to ask families what online safety means to them. And quickly evident, the things that came out most highlighted were accessibility. Were all the platforms accessible and inclusive for people to participate in? Did they offer closed captioning? Image readers so you can visualize a picture and know what the picture is. Uh, screen magnifiers, um, elements of, of accessibility that are important to any conversation so that people can participate that way. Cyberbullying was a big concern by families. They were worried that uh, their children may be um, picked on or recognized as being different. Um, safety tips needed to be needing to be aware of them and what are important things to be aware of and then do the parents always share the safety tips with the kids um, what came back from the conversations was that many of the parents said I've never thought of actually telling my kids what safety tips are I'm usually close enough by or in proximity so that I keep them safe and I'm aware but as we start these conversations parents are starting to think about maybe I, I should have that conversation with my kids to, to make them more aware of the safety considerations uh, considering cognitive, emotional, and sensory experiences of, of the individual as well. Feeling safe, protected, and included. Um, the confidence of the presenter and the content, meaning that you want to know who the, the person is, you want to be familiar with them before you start, and you want to feel confident with the things they're saying and doing with the children that are involved in the virtual experience. The virus protection as well, privacy, inclusion. Are there ways to make things more inclusive? Are there ways to make things more interactive? Um, other ways to create more opportunities. And then the other big piece that came up and the final piece that family shared with us that was most important was safe spaces and safe places. So providing a place for safe spaces and safe places. We have two incredible staff, of many incredible staff here at Variety Ontario, uh, Tracy Schmidt, who is known as Unstoppable Tracy. And one of the things that Tracy highlighted in the conversations was that with Karen and our team here at Brady Village, the important thing is that we always include people with disabilities in any conversations that we have. We engage and we, we reflect back on the motto of nothing about us without us. So it really kind of impacts that statement of knowing that people with disabilities are represented, they can share lived experiences and offer support um, where needed. Tracy's support is led through um, teaching staff. <laughs> uh, she leads a lot of our workshops. She's worked with our rehabilitation and community programs and our ability and action programs as well. Robert Hampson is another uh, longtime ambassador of Variety. He grew up at Variety Village uh, when he lost his sight at the age of seven. And he continues today after studying fitness and health at St. Lawrence College. He continues to work with us and be involved in the workshop delivery. And for Robert, again, he shared that excitement around well, what, what makes Variety different from other places that as he's asked. Um, there's a conversation around what works, what's accessible, what's inclusive and the things that he can share to, to share his experiences, his expertise, to make sure we're providing accessible and inclusive programming at all times as well. So we looked at kind of three areas, uh, online safety prior to participation, online safety during participation, and online safety following participation. And some of the, the points that came up very quickly are, again, that accessible piece as well, sharing, ensuring that text has color contrast, so there's not uh, black writing on a gray background, 
or a red background with black writing on it to make it visible so people can read it. Uh, the sizing contrast of the, the lettering and the images, uh, clear print um, image readers to understand what photos and logos are available, um, and if audible to provide closed captioning in addition to if, if that is a choice. Um, is information shared with children? Uh, what's unacceptable in terms of content and what do children need to know and share and report if something's unacceptable? How do they report it? Creating approachable conversations to talk about the experiences sometimes during and sometimes after the experience too, but prior to what is the experience going to be like? What types of things can the child expect? Are guest presenters aware of school and board guidelines and recommendations um, and the expectations as well? So is that information shared with instructors prior to participation to initiate conversation around what do we need to know in terms of the guidelines received already by families that we should be adhering to in addition to? Technology use and availability. Um, there's voice recognition, there's magnifiers, there's touch screen. Is making sure that people have those things available to them um, when needed. For a lot of children, they, they don't have access to technology, so finding ways to, to provide that. Uh, during participation, I talked a little bit about this before, and you can tell that it comes up quite a bit. Um, is my home safe? <laughs> is my, my furnishings or my accessories safe? And is my child safe during the activities that we're doing? Um, it's a chance to kind of enforce that six feet or two meter rule around space. So you can actually use that as a transition piece for learning at home too for physical activity. Thinking about reminding children of spatial awareness so that everything in your house doesn't get broken when people participate. Uh, staff providing clear directives and language to include and support the conversations um, with the equipment, knowing how to use the equipment, what the equipment is for, how the equipment is cleaned before and after, and where the equipment is stored. So after the, the activities, where would you put the equipment, where would it be kept, and where would it be maintained? I found it interesting through a lot of these conversations and talking with a lot of community programs and schools and asking about equipment prior to COVID, um, I don't think, and I probably should show this, the equipment was cleaned very often or at all. So a lot of times a basketball would be used on numerous occasions on numerous days without any um, adherence to cleanliness as well. So it's a chance to kind of think about equipment that's provided or that's available, how we clean it, how we store it, and how to keep it safe too. We want it to be fun, we want it to be interactive, we want it to be engaging more than anything. So that online experience, we want to make sure it's important. Uh, people can be hesitant when they're starting something new. Uh, it's providing a transition. It's a big change for a lot of children to go from a practical program to a virtual program. So it's a transition piece and it's that conversation that starts before, um, during and after. Again, with our camps this summer, what um, maintained a lot of interest was Karen and the, the summer camp staff team did a transition video. So explaining to families what they could expect when they arrived at Brady Village for summer camp programming. And it was met with a lot of excitement from families because it gave them a chance to not only visually see what was happening, um, to hear what was happening, but to see some of the faces of the people that they're going to meet when they arrive at Variety for camp programming too. So uh, a lot of that information was reused by other organizations as well, which is a great compliment to us. And at the same time, it was a really great chance for kids to become familiar again with our programs, with our services, with our facility and the staff that are here too. Um, I think after, at the conclusion of, of everything, the online safety component continues, putting away that equipment, washing your hands, <laughs> uh, recognizing all levels of participation. So um, based on how involved people are or feel, recognizing and supporting that conversation as well. For a lot of our members and participants in our programs, um, they may have limited verbal capacity to communicate as quickly as the conversation goes from time to time. So we want to create space so that kids can, can share their thoughts, share their ideas through a number of um, augmented tools and communication devices. Um, support and thank and recognize everybody for participating. Privacy and confidentiality, of course, are of the utmost importance at all time. And any information that's going to be shared must be um, reviewed and, and adheres to by the group organization or school as well. For workshops, what we found interesting was that in prior to most workshops, there's really no conversation around your online safety as an instructor or as a participant. So it's really kind of making people feel comfortable, uh, getting people aware and knowing that you're creating a platform and experience where everybody feels welcome, everybody feels accepted and everybody feels excited about what they're doing and how they're involved as well. So 
And just in wrapping up, I think um, we've been excited about the programs we're doing. We've been excited to introduce them on a digital platform. We're still learning ourselves um, and we're excited to be part of this collaborative, connecting the conversations around online safety and the, the great programs and services that everybody offers. So thank you for the opportunity to share. And uh, Archie, if I could just add a couple footnotes to, um, to what you were speaking about before mm -hmm. we go over to questions. Um, you know, I think really, you know, what Archie was really um, expressing was the fact that our success has really been because we have knowledge about working with kids with disabilities for 70 years. So we've, we've acquired knowledge, we've learned how to do that, we've um, um, developed that skill. And, you know, and, and then in so doing through education, through sport, through sport and rec, um, as Archie mentioned, we developed ambassadors. We have ambassadors such as Robert Hampson, uh, Tracy Schmidt. We have ambassadors uh, that, are, that are out creating a culture of inclusion in their own communities. And so, and, and so part of what we needed to harness in our Children in Motion program is a way for kids to be participating, to be participating in sport and rec, to have that interactive ability, and also to create, um, to create those champions for change within them and their family. Because again, the way that we had done it in the past was that we were going to these locations. We were creating the culture shift in the organizations. We can't do that anymore. In a digital age, it's really del direct delivery from us to, that, to the children, to the child's family. And so we're trying to do a whole bunch of things that we were able to do when we were able to deliver programs interactively. Now we've got to figure out how to do it digitally. And that's very complicated. <laughs> and so what we did, and as Archie mentioned, when we we're developing our Children in Motion program that we're going to launch at the end of March, we, we made a special conscious effort to use children with a disability to do the activities. We also have to supplement the virtual space, we also have an interactive component where one of our coordinators or directors, Steve, he's actually gonna supplement the virtual children in motion experience with an interactive experience where he's on a Zoom call interacting with families and these families can be anywhere in the province. So before, to take just to take a step back, so you know, Steve delivered this program um, at, at, at in Vaughan in one of the municipalities in Ontario and he had a number of children participate and halfway through the program, a father pulled a child. And Steve was like, why did you pull the child? Like, why did you pull the child? Was there something we need to adapt in the program? And the dad said, no, my son has autism and I knew he was gonna act out. And we've been asked to leave every single program that we've ever registered for. So I just thought I'd take my child out before we were asked to leave. But because Steve had that relationship with the father, he was able to say, bring your son back. We will figure out how to adapt our program. If your son acts out, it's fine. We will deal with it. That, and that instant, that, that boy was included, that father was included, the, bo the father and the boy came back, the boy finished the program, the son finished the program, and the dad had a chance to see his son succeed. His son had a chance to succeed and then went on to succeed in other things like gym. And it, it sounds so small, but the simple act of succeeding then leads to other successes. It leads to that child advocating for themselves. It leads to parents being able to advocate to, for their child because so often they're told no. And so when we think about a digital age and delivering this experience digitally, safely, being able to accommodate, it is, it is actually a significant, it's a huge challenge. So some things we've been able to do rather quickly, pivot our ability in action program, which we deliver to the schools, we were able to do that really quickly. But our children in motion program is extremely complicated to deliver online because so much of the value of that program is the interactive experience. So all that to say is that we look forward to launching the children in motion program and we we're grateful for these partnerships because we wanna launch it far and wide because one of the other challenges that we have that we wrestle with is how do we deliver these, these programs to these kids who need it? Because we can't be everywhere. So we're hoping through trial and error that we're gonna get this pretty much right. And that we're gonna get kids to be able to participate first and foremost. We're gonna get parents feeling that their children are in a safe environment participating digitally. We're gonna create a, a space where they can have interactive discussions and they can still hone and develop those interactive skills. And we're gonna to try to also build that culture of inclusion and change in these kids and these families that when these restrictions lift and they will, 
that we've created these ambassadors that can go out in the community and then advocate for themselves. And that, that's not a small enterprise. <laughs> that's something that um, will be will is is challenging us as an organization because we've never done this before, but we know the importance of it. Because if 50% of kids with a disability didn't have friends before the pandemic, it's only worse now. And so we need to break down so many barriers. And that has been our call to action. And these kids will make it through because we know, um, as you know, because you work with kids and youth, how resilient they are. But you know, we we take it as our opportunity to figure out how we can break down some of these barriers so that these kids' resilience can shine through and that they can go on to become the best versions of themselves. So thank you. Thanks, Archie. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much to both of you, Kerry and Archie, for such an enlightening and powerful presentation today. Um, I've learned so much from both of you. Um, I hope all of you listening um, have also enjoyed this incredible presentation. Uh, so we're going to take a moment now to answer some of the questions in the q and I believe we have one already. Um, so if you have not already asked your questions, please feel free to type them in the, the Q&A box and we'll get to them. But the first question, Karen and Archie, is does Variety um, have resources and tools that could help other organizations be more inclusive? Archie, you want to take that? Or? Yeah. Um, so the, the Instructor Inclusion workshops that we offer are a great chance for, for staff and volunteers and, and um, affiliates to learn more about inclusive practices. Uh, for the online experience, um, it's definitely a way that we can have a further reach as well. Um, our, our programs typically kind of generate uh, excitement across the province of Ontario, but now that we're virtual and we have this opportunity, we can really kind of extend those services to anywhere in the country, I believe. So we're pretty excited about that to offer as a tool and resource. Uh, when the Children in Motion video information is available, that'll be something that we can share far and wide as well. And the Ability in Action School program also now, um, prior to um, being released digitally, and um, it was only offered in person. So now this is a chance that we can offer this across the country as well, if, if people are interested too. Great, thank you so much. And another question that's quite related. Um, are there resources that you could share about adapting the virtual space? So you mentioned a couple a couple items like closed captioning and so on and so forth, uh, but wondered if you could suggest some more. Give me some, some more accessibility ideas. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I think a lot of it's gonna come back to conversations with people with disabilities to, to know uh, the needs and interests of the individual, um, also the group and, and association. So an example would be our adult day program that we've started to, that I forgot to talk about, <laughs> we started to run virtually. Um, there's a lot of conversation around um, allocating more time for conversation so that people that um, didn't participate as quickly or as readily in a conversation could have more time to kind of share their, their thoughts or ideas. Uh, the accessibility component uh, following the AODA guidelines, which are um, the Ontario guidelines for accessibility with Ontario, accessibility for Ontarians with the Disabilities Act um, are a lot of the guidelines we follow in AODA principles and accessible practices. With the online component, um, part of this collaboration that Jamie Lee and that Dina have initiated are gonna have a lot of great resources that will, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> include accessible and inclusive ideas to promote online safety. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any questions, any further questions in the Q&A, but I do have a question for you both. Um, so when you transitioned from like the in-person space to the online space, um, in terms of facilitation, were there kind of different, did that take a different shape? Were there different kind of tools and resources or just the way that you actually facilitated? Did that shift drastically? Or were you able to take those kind of in-person tools and tips and just, you know, put them into a virtual space and have that work kind of seamlessly? Or was that a completely different approach. So I'll offer you my observations on it and then Archie can keep me honest that it was um, when we when we shifted from the inner in person to the virtual it, it was a it was a significant shift because part of how we um, do or deliver our programming is it's very iterative and interactive. So we based on the skills and the abilities of the children that we're with we then adapt ourselves in real time to be able to deliver programming. But when we think about shifting that to a virtual space, we don't know 
who, uh, what the abilities of the children are that are participating because they could be far and wide. They could be all over Ontario. So whereas we had, as Archie mentioned, you know, at Variety Village, we had classes of 40 that would go through three times a week. And in Vaughan, we had classes of, of, of 12. And in MLSC, we had classes of 20. Here, we could have a class of 180 at any one time participating virtually. And we don't know how to adapt ourselves in the moment. And so recreating that program that has levels that the, the child can participate in at their level that's intuitive for them or their, or their parents um, to, to help them get that uh, recreational opportunity and then link it together once a week by a Zoom chat um, so that you can get that interactive experience was, was not, um, that was, it's been a huge shift for us in terms of how we um, visualize um, capturing the value of our program and being able to offer it in a digital space. And then for families as well, I mean, to, you know, for families, dropping their child off at a, at, a, at a variety program, whether it's at Variety Village or Vaughan or MLSE, um, and knowing that their child was in a safe space provided a respite for that family. So those parents, so that they could actually um, take a break and they can do their own networking or they could do, just have a coffee or have it, you know, just have that, that break and know that their child was safe. Was, is a huge aspect of our program as well. So how we recreate that um, is something that we're still grappling with, to be honest, because we still need the parents to be there when the kids are doing the exercise or the recreation activity, <laughs> or as I already said, <laughs> the lamps might break or the window might shatter, and we don't want any of that. So, um, so it's not perfect. And again, creating those ambassadors for change and inclusion is something that we still wrestle with. How, because that, that's a component of our program that we're just not sure we're able, we're gonna be able to digitize. Um, for me, for me, just because this is the first I've heard of this type of program online, it's it's quite innovative. So it makes sense that it's been a bit of a struggle to adjust, but I feel like you're paving the path for the rest of us. So thank you for doing that. Um, we have one more question here in the chat box. Um, often we think about keeping you safe online in the in the form of cyber security, things like password and data protection, age appropriate websites. Is it really, though, it is really interesting to hear you talk about other safety measures and considerations that come with virtual engagement beyond these commonly discussed safety considerations. Uh, so they're just saying thank you and looking forward to the resources. So sorry, sorry, not a question, just a comment, but a very kind comment. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Um, okay. So I don't see any more questions in the chat box and nothing in the chat, uh, the Q&A box, either at this time. Maybe we'll leave, I'll give it like 10 seconds to see if something pops up. Okay. All right, if that is all of the questions that we have, um, just, you know, brings us to the end of the session. And uh, we invite everyone who attended to view the resources. Um, and the recordings of the session uh, on the conference event page. So um, digitalresilience.ca, it's on the screen. And to tweet about the conference, if you could, using hashtag digitalresilience2021 and to tag us on social media. So uh, thanks again, of course, to Carrie and Archie for answering those questions and for a great presentation on virtual physical activity programs designed to support the development of inclusive sport and recreation in online spaces. It was a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. And thank you all for attending. Merci à toutes et à tous d'avoir assisté à la séance.